Okay, hi everybody. Please let me know in the chat if you see me and hear me. Hopefully you do. Um, I'm producer Susie, Susie Murph, and I am here today in for Dr. Pamela and Annie Wilson. And apparently I'm joining the crew of streamers here on the show, trying to stream at least once a week. And I've also joined the purple hair people. You can let me know. And as a matter of fact, if we can get donations up to $10,000 this week, which we only need about $500 or so, and I have no idea how to show you that on the stream, so you'll have to ask Annie for that. But if we get up to $10,000 this week, I promise I will go to the salon and get fully purple hair if you guys want to do that for us. I am totally up for you guys deciding things for me to do if you will donate to support us. So anyway, let me get that pitch out. And now, yeah, Paranor says full purple. Yeah, right now it's just kind of around my face and I did it yesterday, so it's kind of washing out. But um, yeah, we're going to start and I'm going to be reading you some press releases. So I apologize for looking down and reading. I have the script over here on my iPad. So I will be reading, but I will give you pretty slides to look at. And uh, we're gonna be talking about the Hubble Space Telescope. So let me go ahead and make sure I'm showing you the right slide because there's a lot of moving parts here. This is fun. So I will go ahead and pull this up. And you'll see me looking down and reading. I apologize for that. Um, get my script back up because my iPad went to sleep. All right, here we go. So today is the Daily Space for Monday, January 6, 2020. I am your host, Susie Murph, here with the crew from Dr. Pamela Gay and Annie Wilson, and I am here to put science in your brain. So this week is the 235th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. Held in Honolulu, Hawaii, this meeting is giving some of our team the chance to interact with the people making the news. While some of us are left behind to keep everything going here at CosmoQuest. So due to the time zone differences, today's daily space is built on some of yesterday's press releases, but our podcast coming out later today will be a more rounded out set of stories. Dr. Pamela is actually working on that right now. If you've listened to our podcast, this episode might be a reason for you to turn, tune in. So today's news is full of stories pointing out just how important the Hubble Space Telescope is. It's been, I lost my place. <clears throat> this is my first day. Give me a minute. Okay. Today's news is full of stories about how important the Hubble Space Telescope has been to our understanding of space science. This telescope, after its rocky start, has contributed amazing views in science for almost 30 years now. I know it doesn't seem like it's been that long, but it has been 30 years. That's kind of hard to imagine. Um, but the first story we have today is how the Hubble has imaged a majestic spiral galaxy, galaxy UGC 2885. This may be the largest known in the local universe. It's two and a half times wider than our Milky Way and contains 10 times as many stars. This galaxy has also been nicknamed Rubin's Galaxy after astronomer Vera Rubin by Benny Hull Huerta of the University of Louisville, Kentucky, who observed the galaxy. Researchers are still seeking to understand what led to the galaxy's monstrous size. I mean, it's as big as you can make a disk galaxy without hitting anything else in space, according to Hal Huerta. One clue is that the galaxy is fairly isolated in space and doesn't have any nearby galaxies to crash into and disrupt the shape of the disk. Did the monster galaxy just gobble up much smaller satellite galaxies over time? Or did it just slowly accrete gas to make new stars? He thinks it's been puttering, slowly growing over time. So using the Hubble's exceptional resolution, his team is counting the number of globular star clusters in the galaxy's halo, a vast shell of faint stars surrounding the whole galaxy. In excess of clusters, would it yield evidence that they were captured from smaller infalling galaxies over millions of years? 
excuse me, billions of years. The upcoming NASA ESA CSA James Webb Space Telescope could be used to explore the center of this galaxy as well as the globular cluster population. The infrared capability of this telescope will give researchers a less impeded view of the underlying stellar populations that will complement Hubble's visible light ability to track wispy star formation throughout the galaxy. And I'm proud I read through all that without stumbling more than I did. I'm a producer, I'm not a scientist. So I enjoy reading this stuff and finding out about it, but sometimes my tongue gets twisted talking about it. So if you like what you're seeing and you think I'm doing a great job, give us bits. And at the end, I might be able to get my dog to come over and bark for us. Okay. In our second story, astronomers using the male telescope at Kitt Peak National Observatory, a, pro a program of the National Science Foundation's National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory, that's one that needs an acronym, have identified several overlapping bubbles of hydrogen gas ionized by the stars in early galaxies. Thank you for the bits. I appreciate that. I will come back later. Thank you, Keeper of Maps, for the cheers. Uh, I have my laptop over here so I can see what's going on. So if you see me looking to the side, it's because I'm checking. Thank you again. I hear the bits. It's awesome. And I have headphones in, so my dog can't hear the bits because he hasn't been trained in that yet. But we'll take care of that. As, we, as I get better at doing this, we'll get Jake trained. Okay. You guys are awesome. Thank you. All right. So they've identified several overlapping bubbles, and I need to change slides. Overlapping bubbles of hydrogen gas ionized by the stars in early galaxies, a mere 680 million years after the Big Bang. This is the earliest direct evidence from the period when the first generation of stars formed and began reionizing the hydrogen gas that permeated the universe. Thank you once again, Kevlar. All right, there was a period in the very early universe known as the cosmic dark ages, when elementary particles formed in the Big Bang. Oh, what was that? Thank you, Rigel, for gifting a sub. That is awesome. Elementary particles formed in the Big Bang had combined to form neutral hydrogen, but no stars or galaxies existed yet to light up the universe. Aw, thank you all. Y'all are being very sweet to me while I'm stumbling through this. Thank you. This period led, began less than half a million years after the Big Bang and ended with the formation of the first stars. While in this stage in the evolution of our universe, it's in, while this stage is indicated in simulations, direct evidence is sparse. And I'm gonna be working really hard on saying all of this in the podcast version. Now, astronomers using the infrared imager New Firm on the four metal Mayall tel telescope at the Kitt Peak National Observatory of NSF's National Optical Infrared Astronomy the OIR lab, have reported imaging a group of galaxies known as EGS-77 that contains these first stars. Their results were announced at a press conference held yesterday at the 235th meeting of the American Astronomical, Astronomical Society in Honolulu. And you may have seen, we live streamed some of the press conferences yesterday, and you can find them below here on our Twitch stream. So, some of these may be the things we were talking about then. Okay, the young universe was filled with hydrogen atoms, which so attenuate ultraviolet light that they block our view of early galaxies, said James Rhodes at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, who presented the findings at the conference. This is the first galaxy group caught in the act of clearing this cosmic fog, which is pretty cool. The team began with an imaging survey designed to detect high redshift galaxies and combine this data with corresponding galaxies taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. This enabled the team to compute what is known as photometric redshift, a proxy for estimating distance. At these redshifts, a galaxy's light is shifted completely out of the range of wavelengths to which the human eye is sensitive, the visible spectrum, to longer infrared wavelengths. 
The criteria for selecting distant galaxy candidates included a clear detection of them in the special infrared narrowband filters used with NUFIRM on the Mayall 4-meter telescope and a complete non-detection in the shorter wavelength optical filter bands used by Hubble. So the discovery of the two fainter galaxies in the group was only possible because of the special narrowband filter used with NUFIRM. Intense light from galaxies can ionize the surrounding hydrogen gas, forming bubbles that allow starlight to travel freely. EGS-77 has formed a large bubble that allows its light to travel to Earth without much attenuation. Eventually, bubbles like these grew around all galaxies and filled intergalactic space, clearing the way for light to travel across the universe. It's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? Once identified, the distances and hence the ages of the galaxies were confirmed with spectra taken with the MOSFIRE spectrograph at the Keck 1 telescope at the WM Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. All three galaxies show strong emission lines of hydrogen, lime, and alpha at a redshift, which means we are seeing them about 680 80 million years after the Big Bang. The size of the ionized bubble around each was derived from computer modeling, and this is something to ask Dr. Pamela about later. These bubbles overlap spatially, but are large enough, about 2.2 million light years, that Lyman alpha photons are redshifted below they reach the boundary of the bubble, and just thus they can escape unscathed, allowing astronomers to detect them. So we expect expected that the reionization bubbles from this era in cosmic history would be rare and hard to find. So confirmation of this transition is important. This cosmic dawn, the intermediate state between a neutral and an ionized universe, is something that has been predicted. So it's really cool that they were able to confirm it. These discoveries are made possible by the availability of powerful astronomical instruments that can probe the universe in a way unimagined by past generations of astronomers. Okay, that was the technical one. Finally, our last, our last story, which is pretty awesome. As a present to all of us for 30 years of science, the ESA Hubble has produced a commemorative calendar of the telescope's hidden gems that is now available for everyone to use and enjoy. I don't know about you, but I have always deeply loved looking at Hubble space images. They're absolutely gorgeous and you can see amazing color transitions and light and swirls and stuff that I mean only the most imaginative art can possibly compare to what the Hubble has shown us and it's real. It's out there. It's amazing. So this is definitely a calendar you're probably going to want to pick up. So Let's see. This campaign showcased 30 hidden gems from the ESA Hubble catalog that are not as well known as the top 100 images, but they're also truly beautiful. I mean, there's so many images coming from Hubble. There's no way we can keep track of all of them or have seen all of them. So these are probably going to be 30 of them that you may never have seen and you can appreciate. It's pretty awesome. They shared these 30 images on their ESA Hubble Facebook and Instagram accounts between September and November of 2019. So if you follow those, you may have seen some of these. The 12 images that received the most likes from both platforms were compiled to make this calendar, which is now available. And you can also access it electronically. So here are some of the images described. I don't have the pictures of all of them, I'm so sorry. but in the podcast version and over in our blog post that I will do later today, we will have the link so you can go over and find it. Um, I actually don't have the link in my script right now or I would tell you. Uh, but anyway, the cover features the distorted galaxy NGC 3256 and you can see the cover here on the slide. It is a relic of a collision between two spiral galaxies estimated to have occurred over 5 million years ago. In January, there is a picture that is the result of 841 orbits of a telescope from the ultraviolet coverage of the deep 
Ultra Deep Field Viewing Project contains approximately 10,000 galaxies. It's kind of mind-blowing when you think of looking at an image that has 10,000 galaxies in it. Um, in February, they have an image that shows a small selection of the Veil Nebula, one of the most beautiful, known as NGC 6960, located roughly 21,000, I mean 2,100 light years from Earth. This brightly colored cloud of glowing debris spans approximately 110 light years. And there's just this list of these beautiful images, and I'm not going to read them all because I can't show them to you, and that it makes me sad. But I will, I can switch over here to the chat because I'm almost done talking. Let me switch over here to the chat, and then I can shift over and get you that link. So here, there is the chat. So now I can switch things behind the scenes and not make a giant mess. And get that link for you so you will know where to go to get the Hubble Space Telescope calendar. Okay, you can get the digital calendar file at, and I'm going to copy this into the chat too, I think, maybe. Hey Paranor, can you put this in the chat as I tear? text to you because I'm trying to do too many things right now. It is www.spacetelescope.org slash static slash Hubble 30 years slash ESA underscore Hubble dash 2020 dash calendar underscore digital dot pdf yeah i did just give you that whole thing that was a long one www.spacetelescope.org slash static slash hubble 30 years slash esa underscore hubble dash 2020 dash calendar underscore digital dot pdf yeah, sorry about that. That is a long one. And the way I'm running right now, I don't have a really good way to copy that in. So um, maybe let me drop it in Discord and see if somebody will grab it in the mod chat and Discord and put it in there. This is why you mods are the most wonderful people in the world because I can say things like this in here and stuff happens and y'all are wonderful and I can babble while I'm trying to talk. So at this point, let me go back over here. I can, oh, I never did. Ha, huh, I thought I pulled up chat and I forgot to transition. There's chat. Sorry, you saw my whole computer. I am so sorry about that. Ah, <sighs> I'm learning. It'll get better. Okay. Thank you, Annie. Annie got the link in there for me. That is awesome. Thank you so much. <sighs> okay, I'll get better at this every week. And hopefully you guys are, are patient and, and caring and love us anyway. And we'll keep watching and donating. Um, streaming can be intense. It's also a lot of fun and you guys are worth it. So I'm going to do this. It's going to be fine. Um, but yeah, I'm used to being on the back end of this, doing all of the fiddlings and things. Uh, so yeah, I thought I had it, I thought I had my, I thought I had the chat up. So you probably saw my whole computer. Hopefully there wasn't anything bad there. Uh, <laughs> thank you all. So now I can take time and look at the chat and see if anybody has any questions. Um, I am not likely to be able to help you with the science stuff today. These will be great topics for deep dives when Dr. Pamela gets back. Um, but if you have any questions about CosmoQuest in general, or questions about production, or you want to know what Pamela and Annie are really like when they're riding roller coasters, uh, 
Feel free to ask questions in the chat. Let's see. I don't know if anybody has any. I'm looking. And yes, Annie, you spelled everything right. Thank you so much. That was a ridiculous link and I'm so sorry for reading that one out loud. Oh. And yes, Kevlar, I will be here every Monday from now on. Pamela has volunteered me to take over for Mondays, which is fine. I can do that. I can take care of that for her. That gives her more time to do all the stuff that supports us. Um, let's see. Someone was asking about what kind of news makes it to press conferences. Um, we get information early sometimes, but we're not allowed, basically we're asked very politely to not release stuff until it is announced at the press conference. So sometimes we get press releases about these kind of things early, but it's really bad form to not follow the very kind directions of what we call embargoes, which means please don't announce this until this time and day because that's when they're doing their press conference. And so sometimes we have news, but we can't tell you yet because they're, you know, that's the way things are done in academia. If you don't follow those embargoes, you stop getting news. And it's a respect thing. You know, we want to respect the scientists who've done the work, the people who have done the research, and we want to make sure they get the opportunity to release their information first, and then we can link to it. So sometimes we'll have press releases that we'll tell you we can't tell you yet. That's what happens. Um, so let's see. The roller coaster question, what are they like? Oh, we have the best time riding roller coasters, all three of us. Um, we all love crazy rides, and so we just get on there and scream and hold our hands up and have the best time. Um, I don't think there was anything anybody was afraid to ride, which is pretty cool, because in my family, we have people that don't want to ride things. So going on this trip with them and just having it be us girls there, just writing the craziest things we can find was actually really cool. And we learned really fast that using the single rider line, because there were three of us, so we weren't all gonna ride together the whole time anyway. There was always gonna be somebody odd. So using the single rider line made the lines much shorter. So we would ride with random people and it was fine. Uh, we, we got to ride in the front of roller coasters that way. It was fun. Okay, let's see. SpaceX launched for later, scheduled launch for later. Annie, you're doing, the, are you doing the SpaceX launch? You can tell me in the chat. Uh, and then we're going to have some more press conferences from AAS. I know whenever they have something that we can stream, I think we're going to try to stream it. Now that stuff is not going to get copied over to our YouTube channel, just so you know. Because AAS has their own channel where they archive all of that. So we're not going to copy it and put it up on YouTube and have YouTube complain to us that that's not our information. But you can definitely watch it here on Twitch where we'll be live streaming stuff. And then you can find it over on the AAS's link. Um, I think Paranor has it somewhere, maybe. I love when I can say things and things magically show up in chat, maybe. Um, AAS has its own archive channel, and so you can find anything. If, it, if it's rolled off of our Twitch, you can find it over there. Um, let's see. Yep, Annie is doing the launch and the earlier press conference. So... There's a press conference around 3.15. Sorry, I, I was scrambling to get this stuff done this morning, so I haven't checked. Yes, Paranor says he doesn't have the link at the moment. Not a problem, Paranor. You are awesome. And But the VOD will be available for a while. Yeah, it'll stay on Twitch about a week or so, uh, depending on how much we stream this week. Twitch tends to stay, stuff didn't stay on Twitch about a week or so, and then it kind of rolls off. 
So you generally do have a couple of days to catch things. Um, yeah, this daily space and the SpaceX launch and that kind of stuff, I will download the videos and go put them on our YouTube as well. Um, Annie is now drinking coffee to repair, to prepare. I have not actually had coffee yet because this morning my adrenaline was enough that I didn't have to have coffee. Um, yeah, that was an experience. Let's see, I'm looking in the chat to see what anybody else is saying. Yeah, there's never enough coffee, Paranor. Honestly, there is never enough coffee. I'm going to go get some right after this, probably to calm down, um, but it'll be fine. And at some point, hopefully, well, Annie will be covering Daily Space tomorrow and Wednesday. And I think Wednesday is a rocket roundup. Is that correct, Annie? Let me know if Wednesday is a rocket roundup. And then I'll be back Thursday. And then I think we're going to flip a coin to see who gets to do Friday. Um, I'm not sure. We'll come up with some way to figure out which one of us you get on Friday. Broken Symmetry is asking, did your maple cookies make it to you yet? I don't know if you're asking me or Annie. I have not gotten any maple cookies yet. Uh, Pamela says she's sending it to me. And she did go to the post office the other day. I was so proud. I was so proud. Pamela actually went to the post office. Um, so, oh, me. Thank you, Broken Symmetry. Not yet. So there's the answer to your question. Not yet, but when I get the maple cookies, I will let you all know because I actually have had them before and I love them and they're awesome. Um, let's see. Wednesday is a type of rocket roundup, maybe a year round roundup. That's good because we've had a lot of stuff to go over this year. There's been a lot of rockets and a lot of things going up and a lot of craziness. <laughs> okay, Pamela says she was sending me the box of cookies, but it was forgotten because there was a bunch of stuff they were going to send back to me with Orion Stroke because he lives near me. So he was going to drive back and deliver some stuff and it got forgotten. Um, it was it, it was Christmas Eve. Everybody was a little panicky and things got forgotten. It's just a pause. I'll get them soon. It's fine. Uh, don't worry. I don't need them yet, but I'm looking forward to them. It'll be fine. And yeah, yes, Annie has a chance to get the postcards out before I get cookies. This is very true. Holiday Madness did take its toll. Yeah, I we had the Hangout-a-thon, then I had Christmas stuff, and then I actually got a kidney infection and ended up in the emergency room last week. So there was that fun experience um so i'm recovering and i'm on antibiotics and i take my last one today and i am feeling much 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 better um but yeah it's been a hectic uh holiday break my kiddos are still home they're not in the room they're being chill for me right now but my daughter's going back to college today so i'm sad about that and my son goes back to high school on Wednesday. So yeah, it's, it's been hectic. It's been busy. Um, we've done a lot of stuff. Played a lot of Dungeons and Dragons because you guys know that that is one of my favorite things in the world. And been doing some writing. So it's been a good time. Having good times. So it's been a very good holiday and now we're back to bringing you guys science and I'm excited about that and I hope you guys don't mind me flailing a bit when I'm on stream. <laughs> I hope you think it's charming and not dorky. Um, but either way, it's fine. Pencil and paper D&D. Well, yes, except we use the, uh, we use an app on our iPad that does our character sheet. So it's really cool. But yeah. We uh, just invaded a tomb of an Egyptian-style general. It's a Forgotten Realms. I, I would go down a geek rabbit hole if I started that right now. I am a rogue. 
I am definitely a rogue. And somebody just pinged on my phone and they're probably talking about this right now. Um, I don't have the bunnies. The bunnies are at my DM's house. Um, so there is a character in our D&D &D game that is an Al Mirage, which is a magical unicorn bunny. And so for my DM's Christmas present, I made a unicorn bunny. I took a stuffed animal and I made a horn for uh, out of polymer clay and cut a hole in the rabbit and stuck the horn in and sewed it back up so the, the horn sticks out the top of the rabbit. And uh, gave it to him for Christmas and found out that that was probably the best present he got all Christmas and now I'm all choked up thinking about it. Um, but yes, that was the thing was I will post a picture of the bunny in Discord. Tell me what channel to put it in because I have pictures. The bunny's name is Aziza and she is adorable. And I am now embarrassed that you guys are all talking about this because this is me really geeking out. And yeah, really enjoying it. So Sunday afternoons, that's where I disappear to is I go play D&D. So we've been having a really good time. All of the places. Oh, did you see Jake? Did you see Jake in the background? Jake! I don't know if you can see. Come here. Come here. Come here. Let me see if I don't screw this up too much. Hi, Jake. There. You at least got to see Jake a little bit. Um, he's he's right here begging me for stuff right now. Um, so, okay, let me do my little credits and we'll finish this up and I can get back to working on the podcast version and doing the blog post and getting all this out and making it make sense, be coherent and Go look up the Hubble Space Telescope because the images out there are absolutely gorgeous. And if you don't have one of those as the background on your computer, what are you doing? No, I'm just kidding. I don't have one as background on my computer right now either. But I'm going to go and change it this afternoon, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. All right. Thank you all for watching. The Daily Space is a production of the Planetary Science Institute, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicating to exploring our solar system and beyond. We are here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you. So, thank you. If you want to support us, please check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. All right, let's see. Anything else I want to tell y'all? Tune back in later today. Turn on your notifications so you'll know what's going on because this week stuff will be popping in all the time, including hopefully an astronomy cast at some point. Pamela and Fraser are both in Hawaii at AAS and Fraser has refused to give me a time for when they will be doing astronomy cast. So I don't have a way to schedule that for us right now. So. Keep your notifications on on Twitch and we will do our best to let you know as soon as they let me know if we're going to have an astronomy cast when and where. Uh, this is part of the herding cats that I do sometimes. Yeah, typical Fraser. We love him, but boy am I glad I work for Pamela. <laughs> She's much easier to herd. Um, and Jake agrees. So, all right. Everybody, I will let you go, but tune in later. Annie will be back. We will have press conferences. Jake has opinions on this. Uh, we will have press conferences and rocket launches and all the cool stuff. And Annie will be back with Daily Space tomorrow. So, all right. I'm going to try to roll the credits. Fingers crossed they'll roll. And I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.